Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can, Dr. Athill. We are live um, for everyone on the call right now. Just thank you for joining us. We're just gonna wait for a few more people to join the webinar and then we'll get started with the presentation. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Alicia Cook, and I am the Manager of Marketing and Communications at Sharp Memorial Hospital. I will be your host for tonight's webinar on advanced treatment options for AFib. We hope that all of you are well, and again, we thank you for joining us. First, I'd like to provide some general information about this evening's event. For this webinar, it is not necessary for you to start your video. To ensure that you can best see the information we are sharing tonight, only our presenter and the PowerPoint slides will be shown on screen. We have also turned off audio for our attendees to minimize, minimize background noise or other disruptions. If you are having technical difficulties at any time or need to contact us, please let us know through, through the Zoom chat button on the toolbar. We will also use that same chat button to answer your questions during both the presentation and during our question and answer session at the end. All you need to do is type your question into the prompt. We may respond directly in that chat during the presentation, but we will also repeat your question at the end during the Q&A session so that everyone can hear. Please note that your questions can be seen by all participants, so we recommend keeping the questions general in nature. Following tonight's webinar, you will receive an email with a link to a survey. We would appreciate your feedback on how we can improve this webinar experience. If you would like to speak with a member of our cardiac team, or if you'd like a PDF version of tonight's presentation, please click on that survey link when you receive it in your email, where you can provide us with your contact information. Now let's get started. For tonight, you will hear from Dr. Charles Adhill, a board certified cardiac electrophysiologist and former chief of cardiology at Sharp Memorial Hospital. Dr. Athill will give a general overview about atrial fibrillation, including symptoms, risk factors, and treatments. He will also talk about some of the minimally invasive procedures that we offer here at Sharp Memorial, and then a few advanced procedures that are also available. After the formal presentation, Cindy Walsh, our Director of Cardiovascular Services, will help moderate our Q&A. So before we hear from our presenters, I'd like to share a little bit about Sharp Healthcare with you. Sharp is San Diego's largest healthcare system with hospitals and affiliated doctor's offices countywide. We have four acute care hospitals, including Sharp Memorial, three specialty hospitals, three affiliated medical groups, and a full range of programs and services countywide. Sharp Memorial was the first hospital in the Sharp healthcare system. We are a magnet designated hospital too. Magnet designation measures the quality of nursing care and is considered the gold standard for nursing excellence across the nation. Only 6% of US hospitals have received this designation, 
and Sharp Memorial is incredibly proud to have been redesignated twice. We are also a Plain Tree Gold designated hospital. Plain Tree is an international advocacy group focused on patient experience, and Plain Tree Gold is the highest level of achievement for a healthcare organization. Fewer than 50 US healthcare organizations have received this award. At Sharp Memorial, we are incredibly proud of our long legacy of advanced healthcare in San Diego. We offer a robust team of internationally renowned healthcare experts, as well as a full range of non-surgical, minimally invasive, and surgical treatment options for AFib. Our team performs more than 100 cardiac ablations every year, and we're, only, and we're one of only a few hospitals in California that perform the maze procedure, which you'll learn about more this evening. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Athill to present, begin our presentation. Well, thank you, Alicia. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, welcome to our presentation on atrial fibrillation. We've been doing these presentations now for the past four years. Usually Dr. Limmer is, is with me on the presentation, but I will present on his behalf later on in the program. We're gonna start off and just talk about what is atrial fibrillation and cover the basics. And my plan is to then move on to catheter ablation and then minimally invasive surgical procedure for atrial fibrillation. Just having some problems here advancing the slides here, which is always a little bit frustrating. Um, Alicia, let's just go to your slide deck unless you've shared. Let me try this one more time, okay? No problem. Let's try this. Let me share my screen again and see if we can advance here. here Looks we go. perfect. There we go. So, what is atrial fibrillation? Well, we all started out with, with the rhythm of our life is sinus rhythm, which is a very regular rhythm that uh, begins in the upper chamber of our heart, which is the atrium, and then spreads to the bottom portion of the heart. Um, the originator of this is the sinus node, which is the pacemaker of a heart. Usually it beats between 60 to 100 beats per minute. And as you can see here with the activation wavefront, it spreads very uniformly across the top. Then it goes through a area here called the AV node down to the bottom. And it is done in a very rhythmic, regular fashion to allow coordinated contraction of the ventricles, which pumps blood to your, to your body and to your brain. And this should be done anywhere between 60 to 100 beats per minute. When you go into atrial fibrillation, the top portion of the chamber becomes very chaotic and at times is beating anywhere from 400 to 600 beats per minute. What occurs then is when this beats very chaotically, then you get this very irregular conduction down to the bottom. It's no longer rhythmic. And most people who go into atrial fibrillation who have a normal conduction system can have heart rates anywhere between 130 to 200 beats per minute. And of course, that is very uncomfortable to have your heart racing that fast. This is probably one of the better descriptions I've heard of, about atrial fibrillation and someone who's, who's suffering from atrial fibrillation. And this really speaks about what occurs with atrial fibrillation and the time frame in which it develops. My first episode of atrial fibrillation happened one Saturday morning while driving on the New Jersey Turnpike after drinking three double espressos. I felt a thump in my chest followed by rapid series of beats that did not let up. I felt lightheaded. I pulled off the highway. It eventually stopped after a few minutes. I quit coffee and caffeine, cold turkey. I took more supplements, ate breakfast, and stepped up my workout. After living free of atrial fib for two years, ago, two years it happened again. My life was complicated. I was in the midst of a divorce. I was under a lot of stress. I perceived the relation between stress, 
drama and AFib that convinced me that if I balanced my behavior emotionally and, and physical aim, it would all go away. These are the thoughts that many people have. I made an ardent effort to employ positive thinking, visualization, and meditation to find that balance. I started a diary and kept record of every time I went into atrial fibrillation. I tried all sorts of alternative methods to cure the AFib. I began to approach AFib as if, as if it was the unwanted cousin, the cousin who shows up unexpectedly and stays too long and whose behavior annoys you to no end. A cardiac electrophysiologist recently asked, why not have an ablation and just end this? Well, I admit I'm scared. And although I'm told that I'm a great candidate for catheter ablation, I am not ready. Atrial fibrillation is really a, a disease of, of aging. When you look at the US population, uh, what you find is that under the age of 40, less than 1% of, of people actually have atrial fibrillation. But as you approach the eighth and ninth decade of life, that number can go up to as much as eight to 10% in that age group. And that's most of the patients that we see with atrial fibrillation. What's expected to happen over the next 30 years or so is that the number is expected to increase over twofold. Um, right now in the United States, we have about 3 million people with atrial fibrillation. And by the end of the decade, that will increase to about 4 million. And 30 years from now, we'll have about 6 million people with atrial fibrillation. And it really mirrors the aging of our population because when you look at the percentage of the US population, uh, over a certain age, you begin to see that we're getting older and grayer. And as a result of that, we're gonna to begin to see more chronic diseases. Strokes that are due to atrial fibrillation are often the most devastating strokes. And 20 to 25% of all strokes result from atrial fibrillation. Patients with atrial fib are four, five times more likely to have a stroke. One in three patients with AFib will have a stroke in their lifetime. The unfortunate thing is that strokes for, with patients in atrial fibrillation are often more severe because they not only lead to clotting, but once it clots, we can have bleeding. Um, and most of these clots, as we will discuss later on, are due to clots in, a, in a, an appendage of the left atrium where clots form. The picture on the right-hand corner is a picture of my dad. Uh, and my dad suffered from atrial fibrillation for a number of years. Um, he was pretty symptomatic with it, but he got good control with, with beta blockers and rate control. And he went through multiple cardioversions. <clears throat> he was maintained in the days on Coumadin, uh, and my father had the ideas at time that he needed to get the medicines out of his system. And at times, uh, first time he stopped his Coumadin, he had a minor stroke, um, affected his left arm, and he was a, he was a carpenter. Fortunately, he can continue to work. Uh, however, two years later, he once again decided to go off his warfarin um, and had a second major stroke, which led to him, uh, which eventually led to him dying from his stroke of complications from it. And so I, atrial fib is near and dear to my heart. And I think he was the influence that made me go into electrophysiology and also study atrial fibrillation. And I will get back to this, but as I said, when I think about treating patients with atrial fibrillation, I think of how can I reduce the risk of stroke because that is the most devastating consequence of having atrial fibrillation. What are the symptoms of atrial fibrillation? People complain of rapid irregular heartbeats. Uh, they can also complain of palpitations, which is a sensation of an irregular beat in your chest. And also they complain of thumping in their chest. Sometimes when your heart rate gets very fast, you, you get dizziness, lightheadedness, and some people can actually faint or pass out from episodes of atrial fibrillation, which are quite rapid. Others experience shortness of breath. Sometimes you get chest pain with it. But one of the things that may be somewhat insidious for most people, they just feel fatigue and they notice it more when they try to exert themselves or engage in exercise. Some people simply have a feeling of anxiety. And surprisingly, some people have no symptoms at all. About 25% of people don't have symptoms. As a manner of going about treating atrial fibrillation, we need to know what type of atrial fibrillation we have. We have 
various categories. Uh, the first is paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which is really the early stages of atrial fibrillation. It comes and goes, it stops on its own. Then we get to persistent atrial fibrillation and we kind of divide persistent atrial fibrillation into what I call short persistent and long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. Short persistent atrial fibrillation lasts more than seven days, but lasts less than a year. It doesn't terminate on its own and usually require cardioversion <clears throat> in order to stop the atrial fibrillation. And persistent long-standing is just defined as persistent atrial fibrillation lasting more than a year. These are a little bit more advanced stages of atrial fibrillation and they require different treatment. Then there's permanent atrial fibrillation where if you've been in atrial fibrillation more than a year and your doctor has decided that we can't get you out of atrial fibrillation with cardioversions, then you, you're in atrial fibrillation and you remain, will remain in atrial fibrillation permanently. This is sort of the last stage of atrial fibrillation. There are many people who can live with permanent atrial fibrillation. This is sort of a timeline of the progression of atrial fibrillation from paroxysmal to permanent atrial fibrillation. And that timeline varies for different people. We can have patients who go into from paroxysmal to permanent within one year. There are others who go decades before they become permanent. But one of the things that we do notice is once you develop atrial fibrillation, uh, the episodes initially are rare and they're short, they're self-terminating. And this is what I have here on this timeline below. And then, you know, maybe some people get it a year later, five years later, and again, it's still self-terminating. Then you get to the point where you develop persistent atrial fibrillation and it requires a cardioversion in order to stop it. You, go a, you may go a few months, a few years, but then the episodes start becoming more frequent. As they become more frequent, they become longer and eventually we end up in permanent atrial fibrillation. Early on in this disease, what we have are triggers or just areas within the heart that fire. Later stages of this disease, we end up seeing scarring within the heart that actually perpetuates the atrial fibrillation. So when you go to your physician, what do you do? How do we diagnose atrial fibrillation? Well, we always start with a history and an exam. When you look, and the first thing that's done when you have atrial fibrillation is an electrocardiogram. I can tell you if you come to the doctor, you know, after you've had your symptoms, most of the time we don't capture it. And it may take a while for us to capture it on an EKG. But what you see here is two tracing. One is a normal tracing where the smaller dot here represents the top part of the heart, the larger represents the bottom part of the heart. And I'm gonna ignore this last hump for now. But you can see that this is the top beats, bottom beats, top beats, bottom beats. When you go into atrial fibrillation, and you can see how regular this is, look how chaotic this is. There's short, long intervals here. And then you no longer see that atrium, which is represented by this P wave. It's all chaotic, um, and you don't see any uniform beating of the top part of the heart. But you can still see the ventricle here beating. And this is how we confirm the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. There are certain things that we do once you have a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation because we want to find the underlying cause. Um, sometimes people have heart failure or cardiomyopathy, weakening of the muscles of the heart where they can develop congestive heart failure. So we do an echocardiogram to look at the bottom chambers here, which is now projected at the top, the ventricles. And these are, this is the atrium here at the bottom. And we look to see whether or not the function of the heart is good. We look to see whether or not there's any leaking valves that may be contributing to atrial fibrillation. Um, and then we also look at the size of the left atrium and the right atrium, because that gives us an idea of the duration in which you've had atrial fibrillation. There are other tests that we do, blood tests. Uh, we do electrolytes to check your potassium and magnesium. We check your thyroid to make sure you're not hypo or hyperthyroid, low or high thyroid. And we also check your kidney function just to make sure that you're, you know, you're not you're not going into kidney failure that's causing electrolyte abnormalities. And it's also important to have good kidney function to use some of the drugs that we use to treat atrial fibrillation. We also may do a chest X-ray, which allows us to look at your, at your heart size. And it also allows us to assess whether or not there are any complications of atrial fibrillation like fluid in your lungs. For some people where we're unable to diagnose atrial fibrillation immediately because it's so intermittent, we may give you a Holter monitor or a long-term monitor 
in order to record your heartbeat over a longer period of time in order to capture the atrial fibrillation. And these are monitors you take home with you. We do stress testing to rule out underlying coronary disease. Uh, we also do stress testing to assess the sinus node, which can get involved in the scarring that occurs uh, when someone has atrial fibrillation. We may do a transesophageal echocardiogram to look for blood clots within the heart or also to assess for valvular heart disease. But as I said before, the main treatment goal for atrial fibrillation is to prevent strokes. This is a, a CT scan of a patient who had a what we call an embolic stroke, a clotting stroke that eventually converted to a hemorrhagic stroke. And you can see this lesion here that shouldn't be here. Your brain should look in like gray matter over here. And this is very devastating uh, stroke here uh, for this patient. So that's our primary goal, but we also obviously want to eliminate or reduce the symptoms that you have. And what we do is we give you medication to slow your heart rate. And we also try to get you back in a normal, medic a normal rhythm Sometimes you do it on your own. Sometimes we give you drugs to do that. And sometimes we do a cardioversion. But the ultimate goal is to get you back in a normal rhythm. So as I've said before, the most disabling consequences of atrial fibrillation is, is a stroke. And we use certain things called blood thinners um, in order to reduce the risk of stroke. The traditional has always been warfarin. Um, therapy, but warfarin has a lot of downsides and it's really being relegated to just treating patients who actually have valvular mechanical valves now. We tend to use what we call these NOACs, these newer agents that have come along in the last 10 years that are easy to manage and are safer. These are Xarelto, Eliquis, Pradaxa, Cerveza. Uh, and one of the alternatives that's come up in the last few years is the left atrial occlusion devices. The only one that's out on the market now is, is a device called a Watchman. And I will discuss that a little bit later. So once you've been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, we sort of sit and think about what is your risk of having a stroke? And there are certain things that make you more likely to have a stroke than, than other things. There are certain risk factors that we look for. And as you can see on the side here, there's someone who has congestive heart failure, hypertension. Age is a, is a, is a risk factor for increased risk of stroke. If you have diabetes, if you've had a previous stroke or a TIA, transient ischemic attack, that puts you at a higher risk of having a second stroke. If you have vascular disease, like you've had a heart attack or you have peripheral vascular disease where you're having problems with circulation in your leg, that's a problem. Being a female increases your risk of stroke with atrial fibrillation. And as you can see, we develop a point system where you get a point for each of these. There are certain things that are higher points, which is age greater than 75. And if you've had a prior stroke or a blood clot uh, traveling to other parts of the body. What we do is we add up these numbers. If you have hypertension and you have age greater than 75, then you have a risk score of three. So we can go over here to three, that's your score. And we have, this has been well validated. You have a 3.2% risk of stroke per year. Um, and once we get over a risk score of two, we highly recommend that patients go on blood thinners to prevent stroke. Um, in the US, we kind of equivocate over someone who has a risk score of one, and I look at other factors to determine whether or not that person should be on a blood thinner or not. But if you have a risk score of zero, the risk of being on a blood thinner balances out the risk of bleeding. Therefore, we don't normally recommend uh, blood thinners for people with a risk score of, of zero. However, it doesn't mean your risk of stroke is zero. Once we get, once we decide, once we've done treatment for preventing stroke, we now look at controlling your heart rate. Some of you may have heard of these drugs, metoprolol, diltiazem, verapamil. Digoxin is another drug that is just solely for controlling your heart rate. Then we may put you on other drugs that actually manage to keep you in a normal rhythm. Um, you've heard of propafenone, rhythmol, flaconide, which is tambacor, joneridone, multac, sotalol, uh, and amiodarone, and also the fetalide, which is ticosin. There is a problem with medicines, however. Medicines can cause worse heart rhythms than we're actually treating. Sometimes they can cause heart rhythm disturbances from the bottom part of the heart. 
And, and also a lot of people don't tolerate these medications because sometimes they lower the blood pressure or they just make them feel tired and weak. So a lot of people don't do well on these medications. So the options that have been developed is, is surgical. There is the surgical option, which I will talk about later. Um, but then the predominant treatment for patients with atrial fibrillation <clears throat> who cannot tolerate drugs or fail drugs is catheter ablation. If you go into atrial fibrillation and you stay in atrial fibrillation, one of the things that can be done uh, is what we call a cardioversion. You come into the hospital, um, you're hooked up to these electrical pads and there's an anesthesiologist who puts you to sleep for a few minutes and we deliver electrical shock across the chest. Here you see someone in atrial fibrillation, that chaotic uh, baseline here and then electrical shock converts them back to sinus rhythm, your P waves, your top part of your heart, the bottom part of your heart. And this is often done uh, for patients who are not ready to move on to the next stage of uh, either catheter ablation or a drug therapy. And sometimes people do well for quite a, some time after their first cardioversion. But once you get into that cycle, um, it unfortunately it continues to happen. So what do we do when we fail drugs or we're intolerant to drugs? Well, there's catheter ablation, um, and then there is some surgical procedures that we reserve for more advanced uh, uh, cases of atrial fibrillation. And I will talk about both of these, but the reason why I put the definition of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation up first was so that you understand that catheter ablation is an excellent treatment for patients who have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. It's not a good treatment for those patients who have permanent atrial fibrillation, or I would consider long-standing atrial fibrillation. Catheter ablation is done by an electrophysiologist like myself. For patients who have had permanent atrial fibrillation or long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation where catheter ablation doesn't work well, we have, the, we have a procedure that combines the best of wor both worlds, a minimally invasive procedure, uh, surgical, plus using catheter ablation in order to treat these patients. And I will present some of the results of those uh, studies. What are, what are your risk factors for atrial fibrillation? Well, I've divided this list into things that we can control and things we can't control. Well, you can't control getting older. You also can't control that your, your sex that you're born. Obviously, women have a higher risk of uh, atrial fibrillation because frankly, they live longer. Um, and as I said, they are a higher risk of stroke when they develop atrial fibrillation. Tall stature people have a risk of atrial fibrillation. You can't change that. And then there's, there's clusters of family with genetic disorders that actually predispose them to atrial fibrillation. Obviously, you can't change your parents. Um, but there are things that you can do. And one of the things that's important when we think about treatment of atrial fibrillation, we think of all the things that we can do before we get to drugs. We think of all the things that we can do before we get to invasive procedure. Well, if you have high blood pressure, you can control high blood pressure. If you're obese, you can go on, begin a diet and also an exercise program. Reducing weight uh, significantly reduces your risk of atrial fibrillation. Also, if you have obstructive sleep apnea, that also is a driving force for recurrence of atrial fibrillation. Um, and there, we may not have the best treatment. Some people don't tolerate CPAP but it's important to treat sleep apnea. Alcohol consumption absolutely has to be eliminated or reduced. And I'm sure I'll get questions about that uh, during the question and answer period. People with diabetes, um, controlling your diabetes, getting your hemoglobin A1C down to a, a, a normal level is important. And obviously if you use any type of drugs, over-the-counter drugs, or even uh, you know, illicit drugs, um, methamphetamines is one of those things that actually causes atrial fibrillation. Um, so these are the things that if we begin treating atrial fibrillation, I have a discussion. If you have any of these risk factors that we can control, that's where we start because any treatment that we give you will be better if these risk factors are improved. I'm going to move on to the second portion of this talk, which is to talk about catheter ablation. Um, catheter ablation is essentially using a small catheter to deliver energy to the heart to destroy the abnormal circuits of atrial fibrillation. This can be done with radiofrequency energy. 
which generates heat and burns and destroys the circuit. There is now, there is also cryo energy, which is you freeze the tissue to destroy the electrical circuits. Um, there's now another energy source that is, that is called electroperforation, um, which is now uh, just being worked on and it has not been FDA approved. That, that may come on the scene uh, within the next year or two that may actually be safer than both of these energy sources, but that's still left to be tested. If you recall from the first couple of slides that I showed you, atrial fibrillation is this chaotic rhythm at the top portion of the heart. And I want you to focus on the fact that this is the left atrium here and off the left atrium, there are these tubes. There are usually four of them, which are called the pulmonary veins. They return blood from the lungs to the left side of the heart where it's pumped to the rest of the body and that's oxygenated blood. Within these tubes are little branches of electrical tissue that connect to the main body of the heart and, re and represent the major source of atrial fibrillation in most people. This is a cartoon of the back side of the left atrium. Now I've cut away the rest of the atrium. The ventricles sit down here. This is a left atrium. These are the four pulmonary veins, the right-sided pulmonary veins and the left-sided pulmonary veins. There's little sleeves of electrical tissue that connect to the main body here of the left atrium. And you can get firing within these pulmonary veins that actually go very rapidly, four to 600 beats per minute and trigger the heart to go into atrial fibrillation. What our goal with catheter ablation is actually to disconnect these electrical uh, circuits which actually generate atrial fibrillation early on in order to prevent you from going into atrial fibrillation. And I will explain to you how that's, that's done. Patient is, is brought into a cath lab and this is a mock-up. We put them on a table and then we insert a, a small tube in the leg area here where we actually then introduce a catheter. We've gotten very sophisticated with our mapping system where the catheter itself has magnets on the tip of the catheter, uh, which can then be give you a location. It's like GPS within the heart. Here is a, what we lovingly call the toilet seat that sits under the patient um, and generates a magnetic field. And that way we're able to see the catheter in the magnetic field. And we can record this and display it on a computer. This is a real EP lab. And as you can see here, there's a patient on the table and there's me, there's the anesthesiologist. We use X-ray, uh, but we have a large screen that, I, that displays the uh, computer generated image of the heart that we use to guide our ablation. And there are a number of things in this room, which is all really there for your safety. We also have a team of uh, within the EP lab um, that actually, all it takes a whole team of close to seven people to do this procedure. Um, we have nurses that monitor you. We have an anesthesiologist, which is not shown. We have representative usually from the company that assist us with the mapping system because they become so sophisticated. And we have people monitoring an assistant that helps me with manipulation of the catheters. Here is sort of an early mock-up of what goes on when you have an ablation done. This is the catheter that's inserted from a leg vein and it's going, it goes into the heart. And you can see the projection of that toilet seat we talked about. And we can project it on a computer screen, this catheter, and then we can move the catheter around within the heart. And here's a catheter coming up here in a cutaway of the heart. This is the right atrium here. You can touch various parts of the heart and you can see that catheter projected here. If I move the catheter here, the catheter gets projected here. And then here's a catheter move to the area of called the coronary sinus. And we can project that on a computer screen. And essentially we don't have to use much in the way of fluoroscopy. So here, here is generating a map of the right atrium of the heart and just by moving this catheter around. The other thing that you begin to see here is colors. Um, and the colors represent activation. It goes from red, yellow, green, blue, and the part here that's projected in red is where your sinus node is. Remember what I said, that's where the firing and the trigger starts. And then you can see the progression here, red, yellow, uh, green, blue, and then purple. And then here's the tricuspid valve, which lets the blood flow into the ventricle and the electricity spreads from the top to the bottom part of the heart. 
This was an early unsophisticated version of our mapping system, but it sort of really illustrates what we can do without using X-ray to do it. So how do we do an ablation? Well, we talked about those pulmonary veins. We come up from the uh, leg vein in the groin, and then we insert a catheter through the right atrium, and then we have to go through the interatrial septum, which is a thin area that we puncture through to get across to the left atrium. Here are the four pulmonary veins. These are the left-sided veins. These are the right-sided veins, and you can see the opening here. We usually put a, a circular catheter into those pulmonary veins in order to record the electrical activity. We then go up with a second catheter, and that catheter is your ablation catheter. In this case, this is a radiofrequency ablation catheter, which delivers heat. And we essentially burn around the opening of those vessels to disconnect those electrical circuits that are, that are superficially on the surface of those pulmonary veins. And we do that for each of the pulmonary veins. So after completing this vein, I would move this catheter down to the inferior pulmonary vein here, and then would repeat that around. It is a very tedious procedure, but we have a lot of sophisticated equipment in order to do this. What you can see here is we have a, this is a rendition of the heart that we actually build with our mapping system. This here is the left atrium. You can see the left-sided pulmonary veins, the right-sided pulmonary veins. We also have an ultrasound catheter that allows us to puncture that interatrial septum um, under guidance so that we're not puncturing outside the heart and causing a problem. As you can see here, the ultrasound, this is the ultrasound catheter. This is the septum. The right atrium sits here. These are the pulmonary veins that we are eventually going to ablate that's coming off here. But you can see we can visualize exactly where we need to go across the septum. We can also visualize where we're burning within the heart. But we also have even more sophistication here. Here is a uh, 3D mapping of the left chamber of the heart overlaid on a CT. Here is your mapping catheter. And this is actually a real life case and the what we see while we're ablating on the screen. We're burning. These are where your ablation catheter and we begin burning around the outside of these veins. And while we're burning, we're actually recording the electrical signals that's within this. And the goal is to eliminate all the electrical activity coming from this vein. And we, with the three-dimensional mapping system, we can turn the map in any way we want. Here we are looking at it from the left side of the chest. Um, and here is the ablation catheter that is the same catheter that's projecting here. And these are the radiofrequency lesions that we're delivering. When we get done, we pretty much go around the entire pulmonary veins, anteriorly and posteriorly go around the right-sided pulmonary veins, and we make sure that there's nothing coming out of these veins at the end. And, and that's really the basic things that we do for atrial fibrillation. Usually to create these lesions, it probably takes about an hour and a half, but the entire procedure take, can take anywhere from three to four hours. So who, who are candidates for atrial fibrillation? We have guidelines that are set out there by our national societies. Uh, in terms of who are candidates for atrial fibrillation ab ablation. So anyone who is symptomatic, and when I say symptomatic, if you exhibit any of those symptoms that we talked about earlier, palpitations, uh, chest discomfort, shortness of breath, or fatigue, you're considered a person who's symptomatic with atrial fibrillation. I can't tell you how, you're the one that determines how symptomatic you are and, and how badly it really affects your daily living. But for patients who have symptomatic atrial fibrillation, that is refractory or you're intolerant to, atrial, to, to medications. And remember, here it is, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, the one that comes and goes. Most electrophysiologists and most cardiologists agree that you are a candidate for catheter ablation. There are other groups. Um, clearly, I think anyone with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, whether or not they've taken drugs or not, or intolerant of it, is a candidate for catheter ablation. And also, patients who have symptomatic persistent atrial fibrillation, and usually, that's persistent atrial fibrillation that's usually less than a year, although there are some centers attacking uh, permanent atrial fibrillation with catheters. Um, I think that the results are very poor, continue to be poor, um, and I will sort of mention something about that when we talk about the surgical approaches, because I think the surgical approaches are, are very effective, um, and even they have their limitations in terms of how they treat permanent or long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. 
the most of us also agree when catheter ablation shouldn't be done. Ablation should not be performed in a patient who cannot be treated with a blood thinner because after the procedure, we have to treat you with a blood thinner for at least two months. Um, ablation to restore sinus rhythm should not be performed solely for the intent of obviating the need of taking anticoagulation. So we, there are patients that we do an ablation on and if your risk score is greater than two, we will continue you on blood thinners indefinitely despite having an ablation or an apparently successful ablation because the problem is that there is a risk, you know, two, three years down the line that you can redevelop atrial fib because of other triggers within the heart and your first presentation may be with a stroke. Um, we do take off those patients who are one or zero off their blood thinners after a catheter ablation that's been successful. For patients who do not wish to continue on, on that, we have other treatments available and that's where the left atrial occlusion devices come in. We keep a database at Sharp Memorial Hospital and I've been keeping a database there since 2003. Um, and we last sort of uh, updated back in February of 2020. Uh, COVID has sort of uh, you know, stopped our, our follow-up for a little while. Um, but we, what I'm gonna concentrate on is the initial ablation because we have a lot of redo patients or referral patients who've had ablations also. But there are 696 patients uh, who have undergone the initial catheter ablation procedure um, at our center. Um, and as I said, we don't even count the redos. Um, and there's equally a number of redos also. 466 patients are, are pretty much gone with the current approach that I described above. Um, and we have 364 patients with one year follow-up, meaning February, 2021, we have the last follow-up for those patients who uh, entered that database. And the reason I show this is that we do keep one year outcomes on each of these, pa on these patients. Of those patients who have one year follow-up um, and our follow-up rate is, is over 90%. Um, overall, with no antiarrhythmic drug uh, for paroxysmal and what I call short persistent patients, our success rate is 84%. Slightly higher for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, slightly lower for persistence. Some would say these numbers are, are, are pretty good numbers, um, but it, it's also making sure that you select your patients carefully. Um, we tend not to do anyone over a year with persistent atrial fibrillation, but I can tell you when you look at people's number, you have to ask them, well, how often are you follow-up? How often are you recording? These data, when we do our database, we, see, we do an EKG at, at first month, third month, six month, and 12 months. We do a continuous 21-day recording at three months, and then we have a follow-up EKG in a year. I can tell you that if, if you look at, if you put implantable loop recorders and you follow these patients, you will find shorter or briefer episodes of atrial fibrillation, which may reduce the success rate but you always have to pay attention to what someone presents to you when they say they have a success rate that is over 90%. That's very hard to achieve. Uh, most of the time it's because they're not following up. But how do we get to these good numbers? Well, one of the things that I tell my patients up front that close to you know, 20% of patients, 20 to 30% of patients will need a repeat ablation. Some patients choose to have a repeat ablation. Some patients now decide, oh, I'll take the drugs because they're working better after the ablation. And it may be a combination of ablation and drugs for some people. But when we go back and looked at the database of the patients we just recorded, 17% of the patients had repeat ablation. Paroxysmal was 18% of the patients. Persistent was higher. And that's expected because those are tougher and they have other areas of triggering. Like I said, when I talked to my patients initially, I said, there's a chance you're going to need a repeat ablation. This is, is another picture of the left atrium. And this is a picture of a patient that that's, needs a redo. One of the things, I, I didn't show you the earlier picture um, where when we do a map of the atrium here, these are the left-sided pulmonary veins here, these are right-sided pulmonary veins. Usually it's all purple um, and that's healthy tissue. When we do the ablation, what we expect to see is, is, is red, which is usually represents a disconnection of that vein where we've ablated all the signals within that vein. Here you can see on this pulmonary vein there, it's not all red. This is the area where we had a bit of a recurrence and this patient came back for, the, for a second procedure 
And all we did was just seal that one area and this patient has done well in follow-up. And so it makes sense that if someone tells you that you have cancer and you need five cycles of chemotherapy, you're not gonna stop it at, at the third cycle. And I think that it's important that if you have a recurrence almost immediately within the first three months, that we don't even ask questions, we go back and we do a second ablation. What are the complications of atrial fib ablation? I think this is, this is always one of the questions that I get in follow-up, so I decided to put the slide up here. Um, there are rare serious complications of atrial fibrillation where you end up getting a perforation that someone needs to go to open heart surgery for, or you get one of the feared complications, which is an atrioesophageal fistula, where you get a, because of the burning over the esophagus on the back part of the wall, you can end up forming a fistula that develops uh, four to five weeks after. Fistulas are very uh, difficult to treat and the mortality rate is high. Fortunately, we've done a lot of things to mitigate that risk in terms of temp monitoring the temperatures in the esophagus when we're burning near the esophagus, and we also now cool the esophagus. There is a uh, one in 200 risk of stroke. Um, this again is, is mitigated by the fact that we keep you now on blood thinners before, after, and, and before, during, and after the procedure. Any major bleeding from the groin is really rare. Most, most bleeding, since we go in the veins, we don't go in the arteries. This is the low pressure side. I can tell you I've not seen any significant pulmonary stenosis in the last 15 years. Um, we do have a 1% risk of tamponade. When we're burning, we're trying to get a full thickness burn of the wall of the heart without going through. The risk of having a perforation with bleeding around the heart is less than, is, is about 1% or just less than 1%. Um, and that's usually treated by putting a needle in and draining the fluid and leaving a tube in overnight. And most of those heal without having any other uh, surgery. Um, sometimes we can develop different arrhythmias after surgery. Some of it may be because of the lesions we created, but most of the time it's because of the underlying problem. I'm gonna to briefly touch on the Watchman procedure, which many of you may have heard of. That's a device that is used to occlude the area where clots form within the heart. This is a non-surgical procedure. About six weeks after we put this in, there's no longer a need for NOAX or warfarin. The procedure time is one hour. Um, and as I said, you're off anticoagulation in six weeks, in six weeks. Well, this is again the heart. This is the left atrium. There's an appendage or an area that hangs off here that when the heart goes into atrial fibrillation, it's no longer squeezing. It actually starts quivering. And with quivering, blood slows down and blood clots. And it tends to clot in a, in a pouch of the heart called the left atrial appendage. And here is a picture of that left atrium. This is the left atrium here. The ventricles are at the bottom. This is a thing called the left atrial appendage. Um, and why we have this left atrial appendage is, is probably the same reason why we can't understand why we have an appendix. Um, we don't have a good reason why it's there other than to form clots. This is a ultrasound that shows a clot within that appendage. This is the appendage here, and that's a clot. If that breaks off, it then goes through the mitral valve and then goes to the systemic circulation where you can have a stroke to the brain or a stroke in any organs of the body. The Watchman procedure, essentially the device itself is inserted to occlude that area so that no clots can form within that area um, that can break off. So it sort of sits there and captures and prevents clots from coming out of that appendage. It is put in somewhat the same way we do the ablation up from the uh, uh, leg vein, cross the septum, and then we insert the device into the appendage here. And, the, and then the device is released. Over time, what occurs is that your body eventually forms a lining and you can see this smooth lining and this area is now occluded. And then your risk of, of, of having a stroke is, is the same as if you were taking a blood thinner, significantly less. So just to conclude this section on, on really catheter ablation and watchmen, which are really, I would consider, um, we call them percutaneous procedures or minimally invasive procedure for the majority of patients with atrial fibrillation, we can control atrial fibrillation with catheter ablation. And recall that we do catheter ablation to relieve symptoms. We don't do it solely to get patients off blood thinners. 
because we can't always promise that. And the atrial occlusion device, which I just talked about, is now available as an option for blood thinners for those people who really want to get off blood thinners after an ablation procedure or even before they have an ablation procedure. I'm going to talk about the part that Dr. Limmer uh, usually talks about. I'm not a open heart surgeon. Dr. Limmer is the open heart surgeon, um, but we've been working together now for the past 10 years on other approaches to dealing with our more refractory and difficult patients with atrial fibrillation. I show you this picture once again. This is the, the left atrium. This is the right atrium, and we're looking at it from the back. When you go into atrial fibrillation, this blue line shows the chaotic movement of the electricity when you're in atrial fibrillation. Well, one of the ways to eliminate atrial fibrillation is to prevent these circuits from circulating around the heart and self-perpetuating themselves. And what we essentially do and what the surgeons do is they really compartmentalize the atrium. They put lesions in across the left atrium, across the right atrium to prevent those circuits from perpetuating. And so you can imagine that those circuits need room to turn around and to continue to perpetuate themselves. But if you put all these roadblocks up, it, you, you can eliminate atrial fibrillation. And one of the things that the surgeons can also do is they can actually cut off the left atrial appendage, which you get, you eliminate atrial fib for your symptoms and you also get off that appendage, which puts you at risk of stroke. The maze procedure um, is, is quite remarkable in terms of when you look at the outcomes of the maze procedure. And these line represents various ways of reducing strokes. Um, and it tells you like, if you have a patient that who is high risk, and you put them on Coumadin, they still have a risk of developing a stroke. Um, sometimes your Coumadin levels are low, sometimes they're high and you may bleed and you can have a stroke. But you can see if you move out over a period of up to 10 years, the risk of having a stroke in someone who is on Coumadin, who is high risk, meaning that they have risk factors that are greater than, than uh, usually greater than five, um, you're looking at a stroke risk of 40%. If you're low risk, you know, Chad's vast less than five and, you know, you and you're on Coumadin, your stroke risk is less. Um, and however, patients who are high risk and they have the maze procedure done, you can see the stroke risk is almost eliminated uh, completely with the maze procedure from controlling the atrial fibrillation or eliminating it. And also from cutting off the appendage, which is where most of the clots form. And as you can see, this data just shows um, how well the maze procedure works. You have to recall that these are patients who have persistent atrial fibrillation longer than a year have been in permanent atrial fibrillation. If we did catheter ablation on those patients, our success rates are less than 50%. With the maze procedure, you can see here combined, this is the open maze procedure where you're doing open heart surgery and you're directly putting those lesions on the success rates for those patients are in the range of 75 to 85%. If you add drugs to this, then you're getting success rates that are up to 90, 91% success rate. And that's why I say, when someone tells you they can eliminate atrial fibrin and 90% successful, here we have the surgeons essentially opening your chest and doing their lesions directly, and they're more effective than any catheter can be. Um, however, the problem is that there's a lot of there, there are issues and complications with any open heart procedure. And most of the time, these maze procedures are done with people who are having open heart surgery for other reasons. They're having bypass surgery or they're having valve surgery and they happen to have AFib. We do the maze procedure. The maze procedure has been around for quite some time, even before we started doing catheter ablation. And it has evolved in many ways from an open procedure um, to what we now call a mini maze and what we're going to talk about a hybrid maze, where these are essentially done through small incisions within the chest um, and using scopes to see what we're doing in order to recreate the full maze procedure that is an open procedure. So we call this mini maze. We can call it the, also there is, we also do what we call a hybrid maze because it's a hybrid between the catheter and also the surgical procedure. Um, the mini maze can't do everything. Um, and therefore, sometimes we also need to do catheter ablation from internally. I can tell you that catheter ablation itself um, can be very time consuming. 
you know, most of the procedures I've told you are, are usually three to four hours. There is a risk of radiation exposure, although we've eliminated that with our pretty sophisticated mapping system. Some lesions are difficult to make. And at, as I said before, it's less efficacious for longstanding uh, persistent atrial fibrillation. And it doesn't allow us to ligate the uh, left atrium, although now in some centers, um, mostly in Europe, because we can't do it in the United States, they go ahead and put a watchman in at the end of the procedure. So this hybrid procedure where the surgeons do most of the heavy lifting um, and is, you know, I think the best of both worlds. And then we can go in and do a surgical precision uh, uh, procedure. We call this day kind of drop the bombs on, on the heart um, and get rid of a lot of the uh, electrical tissue, particularly those with persistent atrial fibrillation. Then we come in as the electrophysiologist after the procedure and sort of do our sniper approach and clean up the areas that are left over. Um, the hybrid maze is a minimally invasive procedure. It does not require bypass surgery. And as I said, it's, it's a stage approach where you have the surgical procedure first, and then within three months, you have the catheter ablation procedure to touch up areas that, that the surgeons can't reach. Um, and the other part of this is, is also the fact that this is what we call the atrial clip that is used to clip off the appendage, uh, that appendage that clots form in. Um, and you can do that with the minimally invasive procedure. So who can this help? People who have persistent or longstanding persistent atrial fibrillation or patients who can't take anticoagulation and need that appendage taken off because they, they're high risk. Um, or patients who have failed uh, other attempts, catheter ablation. If you've gone through two, three catheter ablation and you still have atrial fib and you're still symptomatic, then I would consider referring you to this procedure. Um, why would you choose this? As a patient who prefers to have their left atrial closed at the time of ablation, sometimes people have had previous strokes or TIA who realize that they're high risk. So they want to really make sure that that appendage is gone and their atrial fib is also taken care of, as I said, patients who have failed atrial fibrillation. This is a sort of cartoon mock-up of what is done with the hybrid maze procedure. The surgeon uh, on, initially starts on the right side of the chest and through ports where there's a scope that's inserted. Through the other port, we can insert the instruments that we use in order to go around the pulmonary veins. These are the right-sided pulmonary veins where the surgeon has inserted this tool in order to isolate those veins. And unlike what we do with our dot, dot, dot and small burns, they can clamp those veins and deliver a radio frequency energy within 10 seconds and the veins are isolated. Um, and then you go to the other side, again, through these three ports and you do the left side veins. Uh, and as you can see here, again, this is a tool that goes in and then you have the radio frequency clamp that goes on, delivers the lesion here. Again, their lesions are delivered within about less than a minute um, compared to the hour and a half that we take to do all the lesions. They can do some rudimentary testing to make sure that the veins, there's no electricity coming outside the veins. And then they can do a lot of other things to eliminate the other areas that cause atrial fibrillation in people with persistent atrial fibrillation. And as you can see here, they're kind of recreating the maze. This is radio frequency energy. And the final thing that they can do is they put this thing that's like a potato chip, a clip onto this appendage. And this is all done through the scope. Um, this is not open heart surgery. Um, and they clip it onto the appendage. Uh, and that eliminates the appendage and we test to make sure that there is no fluid under ultrasound going into that appendage. The problem sometimes with the surgeons is they can, they, there are certain areas that they can approach with the mini maze as opposed to having an open chest. And these are right-sided flutters. So we come back with a catheter and we put in the flutter line to prevent what we call tricuspid annular flutter. And then we also go across and test to make sure that all the lesions they've put in are truly um, done well. And there's, there's no gaps in the line or anything. And you can see here, where's a gap here in the posterior wall that we detected, um, that was detected. And 
we put a radio frequency catheter up and quickly seal that. And that doesn't take much time to do that. And so this is the sort of the combination of, 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 of a minimally invasive surgical approach and radio frequency energy. Um, Dr. Limmer likes to say, you can see the cartoons, but we also do real, he also does real surgery. This is the left side of the heart. This is what the appendage looks like, that structure that can cause clotting. And this is how an atrial clip is. This is actually a uh, movie that he made uh, during one of his procedures. You can see this potato chip clip that he's putting on. He initially sized the atrium to make sure that he has the right uh, size of clip. And then what he does is he gradually teases this down around the, uh, the appendage here. And then he just clamps it and clips it and that's it. After the procedure, as you can see here, there's usually um, three little incisions that are made on each side of the chest. Um, and most of the patients, you have a chest tube in for about a day or so, and then usually most people go in and go home at the second or third hospital day. Most people who have open maze procedure, that's a totally different recovery period. You will be in the hospital for seven to eight days with a lot of significant pain. So this is a vast improvement on that type of surgery. The results are really good, as I said, when you look at these people with long-term follow-up, no AFib, 87% success rate. And if some of those patients require some antiarrhythmic, 93% uh, patients remain in sinus rhythm from this procedure. Um, I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time, and we're going to just talk about what are the complications of this uh, potential complications. Well, sometimes if there is some bleeding that develops around any of the pulmonary veins, there is a conversion about one in a hundred of these cases would have to go to an open procedure, meaning full sternotomy and open chest. 5% uh, of patients may need pacemakers, and it's not because they need pacemaker because of what we did. It's the fact that they've been in atrial fibrillation for quite some time. They've scarred their pacemaker area, their sinus node. And once we get them back into a normal rhythm, we discover that they actually have sinus node dysfunction and they need a patient, a pacemaker. Less than 1% risk of a stroke. And then sometimes there, there is a phrenic nerve that actually innervates your diaphragm, which controls your breathing uh, that sometimes can get damaged, uh, but the incidence of that is less than 1%. Well, what makes us the, the Sharp team special? Well, we're one in a handful of centers in California who perform this hybrid maze um, procedure. Um, and we're the only ones in San Diego that does this. Um, we've been able to participate in, in FDA trials uh, regarding this type of procedure. Um, and we often uh, are still enrolling patients for this type of procedure. So what I've done is sort of presented going from drug therapy to catheter ablation to a minimally invasive procedure for treating atrial fibrillation. And all of these procedures are done here at SHARP. Um, and so there's a full broad spectrum of therapies that we actually have, depending on the type of atrial fibrillation you have. I hope that was helpful. I'm gonna end here and we're gonna begin and take question and answer session. Thank you, Dr. Athill, very much. It was a really great presentation. So I just wanna, we're gonna move on to our Q&A section, but first I just wanted to let you know that if you would like some more information on how to select a SHARP affiliated physician, you can call 1-800-82-SHARP and you can speak with a physician referral nurse, um, or you can search on sharp.com at any time um, online to select a physician and Sharp accepts almost all health insurance plans. So there's many ways to get in contact with us. Thank you again, Dr. Athill. And now I'll uh, turn it over to Cindy Walsh, who will answer uh, your questions that were presented during the uh, presentation. Great, thank you so much, Alicia. And thank you, Dr. Athill, that was a great presentation. So I have five questions so far, and I'm gonna start from the bottom. So. Dr. Adhill, did you say that the watchman cannot be inserted in the U.S. during ablations? Um, there are certain, it's, you know, it's more of a billing issue and an insurance issue. 
um, more so than we can't do it. Um, most hospitals um, don't allow us to, to do them concomitantly because they're not reimbursed uh, for by Medicare or the payers for doing them at the same time. Um, I think that eventually this will change, uh, but it really is driven by reimbursement. If, if the hospital does this, essentially they would, they would really hemorrhage cash because the devices, they won't get paid for the devices. Great, thank you. I, I do hope that changes in the future. Um, which AFib patients are good candidates for the watchman? Patients who have AFib and have certain risk factors for uh, atrial fibrillation. Remember we talked about the CHADS VAS score. Um, for patients who have CHADS VAS score of three or greater, uh, most insurance company and certainly Medicare uh, consider you a high risk person. And if you have a reason that you cannot take blood thinners or you've had serious bleeding uh, before, but can take blood thinners for a short period of time, um, then those are patients who are usually uh, candidates for the Watchman procedure. Great, thank you. Um, this question comes up each time. Um, would you please explain the difference between AFib and a flutter? Well, it's, it's kind of atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter are, are pretty much cousins or, or family members. They tend to coexist in, in a lot of patients. Um, atrial fibrillation is when you get that very rapid chaotic rhythm from the top part of the heart, um, where the heart's just firing from multiple different places at four to 600 beats per minute. Flutter is when you have this organized circuit that is sort of this re-entry, this circular circuit within the heart that's actually just turning around in the top part of the heart. And usually it's regular and usually it comes out surprisingly anywhere from 200 beats to 300 beats per minute. Fortunately, that does not transmit to the bottom part of the heart because of the AV node, which slows it down. But atrial flutter usually involves rotation around a valve or rotation around the pulmonary veins. Um, and all you really need to do is map that circuit out and find the smallest area that that circuit goes through and ablate that tissue. Most people who ask this question, um, most common type of flutter is, is a right atrial flutter, which is very quick, simple, easy to get at. Those procedures are anywhere from uh, 15 minutes to, a, to an hour. Um, and if we only see atrial flutter initially, we will ablate those atrial flutter. When we do ablation for atrial fibrillation, I personally always do the right-sided flutter because about 10 to 15% of patients go on to develop flutter and I would hate for them to come back just for something that we could take another 10 to 20 minutes to eliminate. Sounds good, thank you. Um, this person is asking um, if, if they have an abnormal rhythm, but it's not rapid, is it still AFib or how would you figure out what the rhythm is? Well, there are multiple rhythms that can feel irregular and feel fast that don't necessarily represent atrial fibrillation. Um, whenever you're having those symptoms, it's important that you get an electrocardiogram or an EKG while you're having symptoms so we can distinguish what type of rhythm you're having. Um, there, there are patients who have what we call SVT, supraventricular tachycardia, because they have an extra circuit in their heart, whether they're born with it or it develops later on in life. Um, we often will give them a Holter monitor um, or uh, potentially a longer term event monitor in order to capture it if it doesn't happen every day. Um, one of the things that a lot of people are out there now are able to do is they, they can get EKGs recorded on an Apple watch. That's often helpful, although it's not as good as having a 12 lead EKG in an office. And then there are other kind of monitors that are out there that you can actually buy that actually record an EKG. Great, thank you. Um, we have a gentleman who's asking, he's 68, has had asymptomatic, persistent AFib, two years duration. Um, he's taken Sotolol, Zeralto, no side effects, good blood pressure, heart rate 80, and LA size is 47. Um, what would a goal be for him? Or can you think of a treatment um, for this particular patient? Well, there, there are a couple of things that, you know, we don't often get all the information in the question itself, because what I'm hearing from you is that you have persistent atrial fibrillation, which 
means that you are continuously in atrial fibrillation and you've been in atrial fibrillation for two years without any interruption of your atrial fibrillation. What's difficult about this question, you also say you're on Sotalol. So someone's been trying to keep you in a normal rhythm and I suspect that maybe you, you are not in persistent atrial fibrillation for the last two years and you're having intermittent atrial fibrillation because if you're in persistent atrial fib and you're on Sotalol, it doesn't completely make sense because we, after, if we can't keep you in a, in a normal rhythm, at least part of the time, we would not necessarily have you on Sotalol. So I would say I need a little bit more information from this gentleman and, and maybe uh, that can be a question that you can address with your cardiologist or um, we can, um, Cindy, I'll yeah. the way of, you can also have further discussions with her so that she can clarify what may be appropriate. And but I'm happy to do that tomorrow. I can definitely return some calls if we get your information. But if you have persistent atrial fibrillation, and, and the question always comes up because someone says, well, I've had, I've had atrial fibrillation for the last 10 years. Well, what we're saying, and this is a really an important distinction, is that paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, it comes and goes, meaning that, you know, you may have had atrial fib for 10 years, but what we're talking when we talk about persistent is that you're continuously in it. Um, and you may have gone for a cardioversion and you failed a cardioversion. You may have been put on drugs and you failed the drugs to keep you in a normal rhythm and you're continuously in, a, in atrial fibrillation. It's not that we're saying that if you have a fib paroxysmal for a year, you're, now, you're not a candidate for an ablation. If you have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, meaning it comes and goes, you're absolutely a candidate. Whether it's been going on for 10 years, you're a candidate for a catheter ablation. Okay, oh, great, thank you. Um, a person is wondering if PVCs can be a precursor to AFib. I try to sort of separate um, the atrium, which is the top part of the heart from the bottom part of the heart, the ventricle. I mean, most of the time, those things, you can have different problems in each chamber and occasionally you can have both problems. But PVCs um, is, stands for premature ventricular complexes or contraction. Those are extra beats from the bottom part of the heart. Um, those are not usually associated with atrial fibrillation and are a difficult problem, different problem, but those are also can be treated with catheter ablation. We do map where those PVCs are coming from and we can actually do radio frequency ablation or catheter ablation for PVCs. Um, sometimes we have patients who have had atrial fibrillation ablation, they come back complaining that they're still having palpitations and lo and behold, we find that they have PVCs. Um, we either treat that with drugs or we do an ablation procedure, which is totally separate. We tend not to do both of those things together because then we'd probably be in the, in the, in the EP lab um, all day long. Sounds good, thank you. Um, if, if a person's in AFib, should they stop doing any exercise? It really depends on how you feel. Um, remember I told you that there are patients who have atrial fibrillation who are completely asymptomatic. They're exercising, they're doing all the things they wanna do and they don't even know they're in atrial fib. So yes, you can exercise in atrial fibrillation. Most of those people who don't feel their atrial fib, they don't go very fast. Um, unfortunately, what ends up happening when someone has atrial fibrillation is that when you exercise, your heart rate tends to go up faster than it normally would and stays higher for a longer period than it normally would when you're exercising. And when your heart's beating that rapidly, it's not functioning very effectively because it's not having time to fill and pump. So I would say, you know, can you exercise? Yes, you can. If you become very symptomatic and fatigue, I would say overly fatigue or shorter breath, then your body is telling you to stop. And maybe with giving you drugs to slow things down or get you back in a normal rhythm, then you can exercise. But you have to remember most atrial fibrillation is not a death sentence. I mean, the problem with atrial fibrillation is that it makes you, it, it's an annoyance. Um, and, and hope, as we said, we have good treatments for, to prevent stroke, which is, as I said, the most devastating consequence of atrial fibrillation but people can live with atrial fibrillation, um, but a majority of people can't. Thank you. Um, how does one know whether they're in paroxysmal or persistent AFib? Um, 
as I said, you get an EKG. Sometimes you're found to be in a normal rhythm. Sometimes you're found to be in atrial fibrillation. Um, the simple thing for people, and this is one of the sort of the national drives to get people to take their pulse, people who are at risk of atrial fibrillation, those patients who have high blood pressure, those people who have diabetes, um, and you're over the age of 65, we're teaching people how to take their pulse and feel their rhythm. Most of the time, you're, you're, you have a radial pulse. If you can feel that pulse, and you usually need to be taught by your physician, if you feel that it's regular, like you will feel it tapping and it's very regular, then you know you're in a normal rhythm. If you feel that pulse and it's thready and it's jumping around, then, then you're in atrial fibrillation and that's one way of knowing. Um, and the important thing is to find, there'll be times when, if you're paroxysmal, there'll be times when it feels regular, dead regular, and then there are times when it will be just jumping around and very chaotic. Um, but not all chaotic rhythm is atrial fibrillation. Great, thank, thank you. Um, can these procedures be done on patients that have AFib and have had mitral valve replacements? Absolutely, they can. Um, we have patients who have had mitral valve replacements that develop atrial fibrillation and we can do the procedure on those patients. And we used to be hesitant to do it with patients who had mechanical valve because we were fearful of entrapment of the catheters in the patients with mechanical valve, but we can do that now very safely with the mapping systems that we have. Um, so, and there are patients who actually have gone through uh, some surgical procedures that they may have had. Some surgeons aren't very, and I, I not criticize, are very not very good at the maze procedure. Um, and if they don't do it thoroughly when they're doing an open procedure, some patients can develop flutters and they can develop fib and most and I have patients and some of those were on the slides that I didn't that that I didn't um, show you that part of the slide who have had prior maze procedures that we needed to do touch ups on so. Great. Um, thank you. So we have um, a person writing in for her dad who's 93 and in persistent AFib. What kind of treatments would you maybe do on a 93 year old? Um, he's already on, let me see, uh, aspirin is a blood thinner and looks like just some meds for anxiety and depression. Well, you know, I, we don't discriminate with age in terms of the way we treat people, but we also have to be mindful that, that older uh, patients um, have more side effects from drugs. And when we embark on any type of invasive procedure, um, the risk is higher and their resiliency to complications is not very good. I think if he, it all depends, the question you should ask your dad is, is the atrial fib, is he first of all symptomatic? Is he having symptoms from it? And how long he's been in atrial fibrillation? Um, one of the things that you pointed out in terms of treatment, he's on aspirin. Um, Aspirin is not in any way, and I will emphasize this, an effective therapy for preventing strokes from patients who have atrial fibrillation. Um, blood thinners do. Um, and we're talking about true blood thinners like the one I mentioned, the ones I mentioned before, um, including warfarin, although we don't use that that much. But if they've put them on aspirin to prevent strokes from atrial fibrillation, that's not a good idea. Aspirin does work for other types of stroke, but if he has atrial fibrillation, I have patients who are 90 years old, they're really the highest risk patients for having strokes. I mean, if you remember when we talk about age greater than 75 and you add any other risk factors, they're the highest risk and they're the ones that actually derive most of the benefit from being on a blood thinner. But we also have to consider other things. Elderly people do fall. Um, elderly people may have problems taking their medications properly. So all of those things go into how we decide how we're going to prevent him from having a stroke. And those are discussions you should have with your physician. Great. Thank you. Um, someone is wondering the difference between metoprolol and sotalol. Metoprolol falls into the category of a rate controlling drug. All it does is slows the rate when you're in atrial fibrillation. Um, and it does very little to prevent atrial fibrillation. Uh, although that's usually the first drug that someone gives to someone who has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. 
but you're really gi giving that patient that drug more for when they go in atrial fibrillation, they don't go rapid and they are not symptomatic. Sotolol is what we consider an antiarrhythmic drug. Sotolol has a component of beta blocker and then an antiarrhythmic component. So one, it helps to prevent you from going into atrial fibrillation. And if you do go into atrial fibrillation on Sotolol, it has a beta blocker to keep you slow so you're not as symptomatic. Great, thank you. Um, I think we're gonna move to our last question and then I can uh, follow up with any others um, that had interesting questions after. Um, I do wanna mention that yes, you can get a copy of our slide set from tonight, um, but just please make sure you fill out the evaluation form. Um, for our last question, we talked a lot about AFib and clots tonight and concerns about strokes from clots. What would be a reason to um, maybe have an echocardiogram or reason to look for existing clot? Um, first of all, the regular echocardiogram that you get in the office cannot see clots in that appendage. Um, and the reason you go looking for clots um, is when you're planning to do a cardioversion, um, you want to make sure there's not a blood clot there that when you go back into sinus rhythm and you start squeezing, you don't break that clot off and actually cause a stroke. Um, we also do that transesophageal echocardiogram uh, just before we do our ablation procedure and before we insert catheters into the left atrium to make sure we don't dislodge clots and cause a stroke. So the echo really is the, the transthoracic echo, which is the one that's done on the outside versus the transesophageal where you put a probe down the throat, uh, is really done to look at the function of the valve. And you cannot eliminate a clot by, you can't exclude a clot with just a regular outside echocardiogram. It has to be a transesophageal echocardiogram. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Outhill, for your time. And now I'll turn it back to Alicia to um, finish up our program. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Athill. Thank you, Cindy, for all of this great information. We appreciate all of you joining us tonight and we hope that you found the seminar to be informative. Please look out for that survey link in your email and thank you for your feedback on tonight's session. On behalf of Sharp Memorial Hospital and our presenters this evening, thank you, be well, and have a good night.